Hello there, uh, Josh here from Race to Profit. Over you can see me in the bottom right. Um, I'll get rid of my face in a moment to create some more space. But in this video, I thought I would have a look at how to analyze a staying handicap chase. Uh, going through a few of the points in front of you with a few live examples. Um, and as always to try and, well, try and say something interesting, uh, but hopefully useful that you may be able to add into your own betting and punting moving forwards. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is if you watch this video um, and you are well, you think I should be speaking quicker or you're a bit bored or you would wish I would hurry up. Remember, in YouTube, uh, in any video, um, you can click the settings cog down here uh, and the playback speed and you can speed me up 1.25, 1 1.5. 1 uh, do as you please. Uh, and that might help you uh, rattle through this video quicker. And I think I still sound semi-normal at 1.25. So remember, any video, uh, not just mine on YouTube, you can speed up with that playback function. But I thought I would focus on the uh, area now where I now focus. Um, any long-suffering readers will know I had a, a challenging season. Well, it was going quite well until the end of the Cheltenham Festival and the weekend that followed and the week that followed um, before I blew my brains out at Aintree and Punchestown um, but having analysed my results, uh, you know, the season as a whole uh, for myself and Adam, uh, we still managed a bit of profit, nothing spectacular be between us from the 21st of, from the 1st of November, I should say, only around 21 points profit, which wasn't as good as it was looking at one stage. So work to do, but profit is profit. Um, um, but uh, what is going to transform things and improve things moving forwards, certainly from the tipping side from myself, is my renewed focus on jumps races over two miles, seven and further, in particular handicap chases, which having looked back through my results from mid-October uh, for the main winter season are on now around plus 78 points profit, mainly one point win, a few one and a half point win, a few one point each way, but must be around, I think, a kind of 40 percent return on investment, which isn't too bad. Uh, and that's clearly something for me to work on and build on. I started the blog kind of looking at handicap chases and analysing them uh, kind of a few years ago. And I'm back there. Um, and given everything else that I like to do on the blog, the stats, the research, the engagement with you, good readers in the forum, uh, back end business stuff, which I don't need to bore you with, but running the website uh, and doing everything else. Um, obviously, there are only so many hours in the day. And it's quite apparent that from a tipping analysis perspective, my time is best spent specialising in these staying races, getting to know the pools of horses better, the trainers, um, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, and since switching to that focus, we haven't done too bad. Uh, kind of 14 bets in chases, eight of them have been in the first, in the top two. Um, another winner or two would be nice. And I've taught myself out a couple of winners, which I'm actually going to use as examples also. Um, but yes, hopefully by looking through uh, these kind of six questions, although there's a few others uh, within this. I'm going to talk briefly, hopefully, through my process and bring it alive by going through four examples. I'm kind of after the first one, it might just be then a case of repeating myself with different horses. So you'll have the have the chance to stop the video and go and do something better with your day, if you so please. But with any luck, I do say something which helps your punting moving forwards. I should quickly touch on that idea of specialising, of course. Um, and yeah, if you're pushed for time or you want to improve your uh, upskill, I suppose, or try and become even more profitable than you are, uh, focusing on a certain pool of horses, whether on the flat or over jumps, isn't a bad idea. It might be class, distance, a group of trainers, certain courses, um, you name it. I like staying handicap chases. There's normally a little bit of form and profile of a horse to, to look at from bumper days, hurdle days, a few chases, point to points. Um, there's some video analysis and actually I enjoy watching the races. You do all the work and then you've kind of got a good five minutes or so to watch the drama unfold. And you can obviously see different things as well. Obviously, it tends to be a bit of a slower pace. You can pick up jumping errors or uh, maybe a jockey went too soon or left it too late. All that kind of different thing. A horse got outpaced, etc. Um so yes, so that's that's a general point, I suppose, when looking at this list in front of you. I could focus on replay watching. Um, so that's one thing if you don't do and does help by specialising and ensuring you have the time. Um, you know, the more videos you can watch of racing, the better to help your understanding there. Most handicap chases I look at, I will watch the last uh 
race the last run of every horse in the race uh, at least the last race if not the last couple um which is useful for today's purpose and for the kind of memory bank moving forwards um but then you are going through and i'll kind of like i said i'll go and show a couple of examples in a moment i'm going through and asking these kind of six questions or there's a couple of questions within some of these bits but firstly is there more to come from the horse are they unexposed over fences do they look progressive and or are they well handicapped uh, so i generally like to focus on horses who i think there is more to come uh, they haven't yet shown their best in their career and i'm trying to judge whether today's conditions are the reason for why they may put in an improved performance uh, and whether they might step forward on what they've done that can, of course, include last time out winners as well. Um, and or are they well handicapped? Not every race has kind of is packed with unexposed horses, uh, but are they well handicapped? Making a judgment on whether or not they're well handicapped. Of course, there are horses that are uh, hit their ceiling and then come back down below their last winning handicap mark. That lot, that pool of horses are generally open to attack from younger, less exposed legs, but those horses may not be in today's race or indeed suited by conditions. Um, but then you can use other things to work out whether or not a horse is well handicapped. Racing post ratings, which I'll touch on, hot form, which I've got down here, and a few other things. Um, I think a focus on class is important. Does the horse have the class? Um, that can be looking on or not or whether or not they've performed at a higher level. Have they performed at a higher class, placed efforts? Have they given the hint they've got the class? Do their racing post rating suggest they have the class? Does some of their hot form suggest they have the class? So of course, some of these questions, uh, they kind of weave in to each other. Um, and yeah, and that links to video watching as well. How a horse travels, how they go through a race. Uh, you know, some horses exude class and that is something with experiences you watch more how they jump how they travel what they find for pressure how they won last time out did they actually hack up and hit the line really hard all those different things um does the horse have any hot form that's an important strand i think uh and if you don't look at hot form uh is something you could look at as a way to improve your analysis and i'll touch on that but that's mainly looking at what races have the horse been running in and have they been in and around subsequent winners what have those winners gone on to do is it some indication that this horse may be a cut above the race they're running in today the race they're running in today may not be as competitive as that race um but if you look if you focus on the horse who's got hot form it does give you a lot of confidence going into the race um number four what is the pace of the race again if you don't do pace analysis uh, well especially with chases but at any race uh, vitally important is something we can all do um so yeah who's going to benefit from how the race is going to be set up is the horse especially chase is going to be prominent are they going to lead 64 percent of all handicapped chases are won by horses uh, race uh, race that either lead or race prominently um there's been in some interesting chat in the last few days uh, on Twitter um, about you know more connections uh, like is there a case that now more connections like their horses to be ridden more forward are jockeys overly aggressive and actually the place to be in some races now is to be more patiently ridden and more held up but that's something for us to judge on a race by race basis but generally I do not want to be on a handicap chaser which is held up out the back of the telly um, it's just harder you have to jump at speed you have you need more luck in running you need the horses in front of you to stop etc um, clearly held up horses and held up chasers do win but I will generally mark up a horse if I think they're either going to get an easy lead or they're going to race prominently and be in the right place to strike. Um, five, of course, will the horse handle today's conditions or maybe even improve for them? So the going, the nature of the course uh, and distance would be the main ones. Field size uh, to a lesser extent, but some horses like smaller fields, some need a stronger gallop in a bigger field, etc. Um, but yes, uh, will, will they handle the ground? Uh, uh, and will they stay are uh, two big questions of course and whatever horse you go through and you're looking at these questions you're looking at knowns and not unknown so a horse may be unproven over the distance but i think it's going to improve for the step up in trip um obviously going's an important one especially kind of marathon heavy ground staying chases i generally want one to be proven in such going um and so on and so forth uh, point number six is the horse in form now a horse can be well beaten but still be in form but again that's where race watching video watching can come into it 
I generally like a horse to be going forward at the end of their races, even if that means they're still well beat, but hitting the line hard or at least showing something. Or on the flip side, if it's first run after a wind up or first run of the season or they need a couple of runs to get fit, travelling well for a long way in a race before they then drop back. Now, if that's combined then with a dropping class or a slight dropping trip or a jockey change, all those different things, um, that can be important. And yeah, uh, and or what are they doing differently from recent runs? So that's a question I always like to ask. Um, what is the horse doing differently from recent runs and do I think that's going to be a reason for an improved performance so the main ones I suppose are class move especially down in class obviously uh, distance move either down or up in distance jockey change headgear switch tongue tie uh, first run or second run after a wind up, a uh, change of course, obviously, uh, possible change in tactics, um, and so on and so forth. So you're asking that question, what are they doing differently? And if you think that's going to be a reason for an improved performance, um, we then have uh, this kind of extras I've put down here that kind of can underpin as well, trainer stats, course, their recent form, jockey stats, jockey form, trainer form, replay watching I've touched on, framing a race, especially with marathon chases, uh, you know, is it going to be a proper stamina test? What's the ground going to be? Um, is the race packed full of unexposed horses, which obviously you start to build up as you go through a race? Is it competitive? Should I leave it alone? Um, you know, you can build in the pace of the race to that idea as well. Is the favourite opposable? Um, you know, if you look at a favourite when you switch to the market, and I'll touch on that in a minute, and you're really anti the favourite, that obviously creates a lot of value automatically elsewhere in the rest of the race. So that's something to look at as well. Um, assessing the price and value, that's very subjective. It's not going to be an area I touch on here. I do go more on feel and experience. I suppose, of course, that means I get it wrong uh, sometimes. Uh, some people obviously will, especially professional gamblers, um, will uh, compile their own tissue price, make their own judgment, and then assess the market against that price. And that's something, that's a skill set I could uh, be better at and something I could improve, I suppose, moving forward to try and step up another level. Um, but you can do very well in this game without having to do that because I don't uh, do tissue prices. Um, I suppose I do roughly, but again, it's more experience and feel at the moment. And that's something that comes in time. Um, and then, yeah, putting it all together, the process and um, yeah, putting everything together and making a judgment. Um, so that's the kind of uh, rough outline, I suppose. And I like to go through a race and every horse with all of those questions in the back of my mind. Um, and it might be best if I'd switch over to uh, Gigi's Gold with a couple of examples. Um, so Time to Get Up was a nice winner at 12 to 1 on the 4th of February. Uh, he only was backed into 10s, I think, and he absolutely demolished this field. So, you know, with all those questions rattling around in my brain, was there more to come from this horse? It was only the third chase of his life. Um, his age eight, it was only the fifth uh, run of his entire life. Um, so automatically, I'm, I'm assuming uh, he's unexposed uh, progressive. I will just get rid of my face for a moment so we can see some of this, uh, well, see more of the screen. Um, yes, yeah, so unexposed, lightly raced. I'm assuming there's more to come. Did he have the form? Did he have the class? So if you look at some of this form down here, I should think this bit of form has jumped out at you. 11 lengths behind Monkfish, multiple grade one winner, a horse who's, has he reached the low 70s yet? Well, certainly high 160s. Um, and, you know, he got within 11 lengths, of, 11 lengths of him in a maiden hurdle, 23 furlongs, heavy ground, soft here. Um, so he did have some okay form to his name in races that were working out well, actually. Both of these races have produced a fair amount of subsequent winners. Um, he then made his debut for John Joe, 329 days off. You could assume he would need the run. 20 furlongs on good to soft ground. Uh, class 3, um, he was actually pulled into the stewards for this, but you can watch it. He was patiently ridden. He did get outpaced at times. He did hit one, but he was very tenderly handled up the straight um, with another JP horse. Uh, winning that race you can read into that what you please um this race worked out quite well actually canelo followed up so again there was some substance to the form so there was hot form does he have the class uh the form tying with monkfish 
was kind of giving me that impression and how he'd run in this class three in particular made me think that class three was fine um like i said he had hot form racing post ratings he had a couple of racing post ratings he hit 130 which is the mark he was running off here um so that was a positive although it's even more of a positive if they run an even bigger racing post rating than their current mark and i'll touch on that in a minute with the context of these two big numbers here um but yeah he came into this race uh this weatherby run if you watch that race back he was um held up he looked like he was visually outpaced to me but he jumped okay and he did stay on um that that written comment the video watching the video looks a lot better than that um and he was going forward at the line uh, which like i said is what i i like to look at and um or i see as a positive certainly and again this race i think at the time had thrown out a couple of winners possibly one behind him and a couple in front of him um and it was an okay race for the grade as well those in front were kind of unexposed over fences he then came into this win Camden race what was he doing differently why was he going to step up on what he'd done here because clearly he couldn't just repeat these two runs he needed to step forward and the reason for why in my mind why he may step forward and again what we know and what we don't um and weighing it up against price was the step up in trip by six furlongs uh and the combination of heavy ground which he looked like he enjoyed uh, and watching some of the videos he did look a big brute of a horse and just a galloper and just like he would just keep going um which is why this step up in trip six furlongs or so um yeah step up the six furlongs the ground uh third run back of the season after a break big horse it might have taken two runs to get him fully tuned up um and they were the reasons for improvement he was unexposed i had some confidence there should be more to come i was confident by some of this form and the odd racing post rating that he would leave this mark behind at some point that he would he could be could be well handicapped stepped up to this trip in this ground uh, you're then weighing those knowns because i don't know for sure that he's definitely going to stay um but he wasn't a two to one shot he was a 12 to one shot so again you're judging what you know and what you don't against the price and i made a judgment that this could be the reason for an improved show and as it happened it was and he absolutely decimated them and over this trip he was able to hold a more prominent position his comfort speed and his comfort traveling speed which had seen him get further behind over this shorter trip and better ground uh, probably traveling the same speed he was able to sit kind of behind the pace over this 25 furlongs on heavy um so yeah so he ticked a lot of boxes and again next time out he then won the midlands national sent off at threes i i thought that was short enough but it turned out to be an okay price um in the end but you know that's again subjective judgment but he put in in its win canton race a racing post rating of 148 um from a mark at the time of 130 so 18 kind of pounds above i suppose if you want to look at it that way career best top speed figure as well um so going into this utoxta race when trying to judge if 138 uh was still well handicapped well, of course he absolutely hacked up at wing can and if you watch that back it was so obvious he had so much in hand and there was more to come and the eight pounds wasn't going to stop him and the racing post rating would back that up still had 10 pounds below that and then he put in another 148 racing post rating in this race as well there's this then what feature whatever set of tools you use I'm, i think at the races race cards uh do a bit of kind of hot form stuff as well although not presented uh, as easily as it is within ggs um but you can see all the subsequent winners out of these races 16 out of that fairy house four there five from that weatherby race uh, and so on and so forth so he ticked a lot of boxes um and you know then you've got the pace analysis like i said uh you could you know i made a judgment that he would be a bit further forward because of the trip move um and everything else and you can see it when canton generally can uh, pay to be prominent but that's a judgment uh so yeah it isn't necessarily taking at face value the pace map trying to work out of a horse maybe further forward there was the instant expert at the time um and you know making judgments on this i mean i suppose you could look that it was fairly competitive there was a fair few horses here who were quite a way above their last winning marks um again so as you went through uh, and my process i suppose now is now uh, i've turned the odds off i used to have the odds available 
uh, as they were on the, the race cards, but that can kind of sub uh, can influence you subconsciously. Um, so I like to have a good look through without having an idea of what the odds are, uh, and that has helped me in the last couple of months, I think. Um, and then I will just click and open every single horse, and I will just go through with those kind of questions uh, rattling around in my head, all of these points here, and trying to see if they tick those boxes and some of these extras here, uh, which you know most of the time now are subconsciously in my head. Um, but I do kind of have that list to the side. And just to make sure they're ticking the boxes that I like to be ticked and I'm comfortable with then whatever the result may be and that I've done the due diligence and done the job. Um, and yeah, just open up and go through every horse. And, you know, from memory, flicking back through some of these, and obviously now I kind of know a fair few of these horses inside out now, the Kings where it had a question of handicap marks, he'd been beaten on recent runs by something better treated, 10-year-old Springfield Fox came onto the back of a P, look, didn't look in great form, his jumping wasn't great. At, uh, in the Welsh National, Shantou Flyer, an 11-year-old, first run three to eight days, Commodore had some uh, form questions. He didn't look in the best of form, uh, and the kind of um, stamina question this 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 ground as well. Dalak came on the back of a P, um, and the Tizard Yard weren't in great form. He had a few questions. Final nudge, twelve year old, first run in three hundred and forty four days. The man of Pippin again. The yard form he pulled up when he was last seen. First time blinkers, which can be a positive, but in a muddy staying chase, it can light them up too much. You making a judgment about that. Uh, with price, um, Shandy Alley was up in class and been whacked uh, 13 pounds, but he actually ran with credit here and was only beaten five lengths. Um, he is probably done for the season, but he could be interesting in the autumn and he might be one to keep an eye on because he did show improved progressive form here. Um, and yeah, some decent RPRs that are still above his mark. So he's only seven, another summer at grass. He might be making all somewhere next autumn, so he might be one to have a note down. Uh, Cease and Spirit, I think I also fancied on this. I tipped two. He ran atrociously. Uh, Head to the Stars came into this on the back of three, two pulled up efforts. First run after a wind up, 10 years old, usually patiently ridden. I thought it was a bit risky. Ender who I wasn't sure why he would improve on some of this recent form here. Similar conditions, 49 days off, first run after a wind up. So he may possibly come forward, but he said I had questions for me. Bally Cross was 10, open to attack from younger legs. I had a ground question. I thought he'd be better on better ground, but again, I wasn't 100% sure why he would improve on some recent efforts, although this was his second run back after a break, but he was open to attack from something more likely race and more progressive, as was Regal Flow. So that links to the other point I should make when you're going through, as well as all these questions here, underpinning them all as you go through, uh, you can take a negative slant if you want. You can look at a race and a horse and go, why don't I like that horse? Why will, they, why will this horse not be getting competitive today? And I found asking that question of each horse actually helps. It helps me visualize things a bit better. Um, and obviously that helps you create a shortlist because if you can confidently rule a horse out and you're happy if you've got it wrong, i.e. I think you, I think the handicap has got you, I don't like your jumping, to my eyes you just look out of form, there's no reason I can think why you're going to improve today, uh, I don't like the, the, the form of the yard, they're very cold, I don't like the fact the horse might be held up out the back, um, they can beat me etc., um, and so on and so forth. So that that's another a thing you can do. So I think I've probably, with that one example, touched on uh, a few of the reasons and, and yeah, some of those things you can look at. John Joe at the time was coming into this in form. Junior, so on that stats idea, Junior had a good record at the course. Um, John Joe actually in handicap chases at Wing Canton, his record is half decent as well. Um, so yeah, putting all of those things together and the replay watching, etc. Like I said, uh, forming a judgment on this race. I think I then went over to Odds Checker and um, you know saw he was twelve to one and was just like, well, I've got to back him at that price, <laughs> given everything I've said. And if he doesn't stay or it's all a bit too much, fine. But twelve to one looked overpriced against my assessment of his chance in this race. And like I said, having that unexposed horse on side can be well is generally where I want to focus um and, and the horse has got more to come um so yes yeah, so that was that uh and I've ticked round to 25 minutes I'm going to spend the rest of the video looking at three other examples you can watch that if you so please um but hopefully if you you might want to stop at this point I might have been going on long enough for you 
um, with those points I've raised above the video. Hopefully I've said something uh, within the on the blog, I should say. Um, this post here and this video will go and live uh, below these points or above them here as well. Um, but yes, uh, do fire away if you've got any questions. Do put them in the comments if you want or any ideas or you think I'm uh, mad and I've lost my mind and I don't make any sense at all or any things that you look at or things you think I've missed or that I should be focusing on more of. Um, of course, you can uh, post a comment and constructive criticism or questions, etc. Uh, as long as it's polite, is always welcome in these parts. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube or on the blog, um, uh, there's yeah there's a link to the, the blog post below on YouTube and there's a link to the uh, become a member button uh, here if you so want because from Thursday we're on Monday at the moment 17th of May but from Thursday uh, there's going to be a summer ticket offer uh, if you want to join us for the summer if you've been reading the blog in the last couple of weeks uh, you'll have seen what I've done in terms of the stats content and the chat and the videos for Newmarket and York. So there's plenty of flat content to enjoy. There's the forum, there's the chat, uh, plenty of stats content to help you find your own winners. Uh, my tipping focus uh, is going to be on these races, uh, jumps races, two miles, seven and further, mainly handicap chases. And there'll be lots of uh, stuff to get stuck into uh, on those races throughout the summer as well to take us through to uh, Chepstow's first meeting of the winter season in October. Um, so if that interests you from Thursday, kind of 9, 10 a.m., you can uh, check out the Become a Member page and join uh, me and the Merry Racing to Profit band if you so wish. Um, but that's for a few days time. Um, but for now, uh, hopefully I've said something of interest that you can apply to your betting more generally, certainly jumps races and certainly chases. Um, but there's those things to ponder there. Like I said, do post any questions below if you wish. I'm now going to spend hopefully 10, 15 minutes uh, on a kind of three more examples, which may bring to life more of what I've said here um, that you can note down and use in your punting moving forward. So I've touched on time to get up. I'm now going to go on to game line, which was another winner. I'm not just going to focus on the winners, don't worry. I'm going to focus on a couple of horses I was very close to betting, uh, but then talked to myself out of very late, uh, which is annoying, but you'll see kind of why I like them in the first place. Uh, game line, let me whiz through him. Um, he's age seven. I thought there was possibly still more to come. Uh, he was a winning machine, and that's another example. Horses where you think they're still open to progress and they just like winning. Keeping horses that like winning on side and last time out winners in particular and over fences certainly isn't a bad place to start. And I know there may be some punters that just focus on last time out winners actually. Um, and again, as a way in, that's no particular bad route either. Um, so what we have here, we have a uh, Peter Bowen, hadn't had him very long. Um, but he clearly, since Bowen got him and he'd put the blinkers on, this horse's form seemed to transform. Um, and I do like the Bowen yard. Um, obviously, his two sons are very, very good jockeys, which helps. Um, but certainly this time of year as well, uh, for kind of May and through the summer, uh, are worth keeping on side. They had some illness kind of a year and a half ago, possibly for a whole year. I think the string may have been sick. Um, but uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, the bone yard this summer and anyway back to this horse um basically he had run very well in a fair few chases um that worked out very well so i thought he may still be open to progress age seven we had this stratford class five here produced six subsequent winners uh foss lass in heavy class five um produced seven winners it was this run here i liked at carlisle uh 26 furlongs heavy ground if you stay 26 furlongs around Carlisle in heavy, it would suggest you're worth a go over slightly further and you may be a staying, staying, staying chaser in the making uh, beyond 26 furlongs. Again, 11 subsequent winners from this race, which is obviously decent. Um, this Sedgefield run was good. Uh, five subsequent winners, obviously two of those are now him, um, but the winner there that day, Grand Paradiso, then hacked up again. Uh, the second, another emotion, then went and won a uh, class two on Carlisle's finals day. Um, so while this horse hadn't raced at class three, he had been in and around some decent horses that performed then at a higher level. Um, we had some progressive racing post ratings, which I liked, the 111, 113, 115. Um, so they were kind of building all the time and that gave me the impression that he was potentially still open to progress and obviously had gone up eight pounds. 
Then we had, then I was asking myself, well, why would he improve on this Newton Abbott run? Um, and of course, it was all about the move up in distance. Uh, and I thought on my judgment on the replay watching on how we'd gone through some of these races that the step up in trip would really, really help. Uh, and then you're judging it. And I thought I actually then went through all of these other horses and runners and thought some of these class four efforts, particularly these two, were as good as what anything else had done in this race. So while he wasn't proven at class three, that was my judgment, especially as some of these looked to be in the grip of the handicapper or had questions over stamina or their recent form and various other different bits and bobs. Um, and I actually thought his form was no worse than Strictly a Dancer and Friends Don't Ask. And with Strictly a Dancer, who was favourite at the time, I think, he'd tried this course and distance once in a lesser race than this. And he hadn't, um, while he stayed on, he still had a go and hadn't won. And he was on a slightly higher mark. So that was a question for him. Um, and his running style, he was always ridden a bit more patiently. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I pulled all those things together. I had my short list. I went to look at the market and he was eight to one. And the three others I thought, or two or three others I thought, who may get competitive, Strictly a Dancer, Friends Don't Ask, and possibly High Council, though he was 12, um, they were all around four to one. And for the life of me, given everything I said, I could not work out why game line was eight. In the end, he was backed in and sent off at fours as well. Um, they had the pace map as well that was a positive. If I just sort that out here, you can see what I saw at the time. There were three horses that might take each other on, and certainly he would be sat in a decent spot, prominent, tracking the pace, uh, which is kind of around here is where I like all chasers to be, especially when they're kind of not smaller fields, but... Uh, you know, obviously you get festival races where they can go hard um, and, uh, you know, it can be it can pay to be even more patiently ridden. But even so, I generally will mark up a horse if they're in this spot here. And I think they have the ability to travel, jump and hold a position. And I think the jockey won't do anything stupid like go far too hard, far too soon. Um, but the Bowen brothers are high up my list of kind of chase jockeys. Um, and... Yeah, so pulled that all together. The Bowen Yard were in form. They did quite well at the track and handicap chases, and I think either had a winner or a horse go close within this very race uh, the year or two years before, um, and so on and so forth. And I won't go through there. Various reasons, again, with my idea of why why don't I like the horse? Can I put a cross through them? There were various things these horses, or boxes these horses didn't tick, and I was quite happy to put a line from them and draw up a kind of shortlist of three or four and kind of go from there. Um, so again, yeah, you're going through all these questions and putting ticks, uh, ticking boxes that you want, or that I like, the boxes that I like to be ticked, and so on and so forth. Um, let me jump over to the 335 from Utoxta for another example. Uh, one I taught myself out of, Captain Tommy, I kind of had a shortlist of two of all the gin joints for Colin Tizard, Colin Tizard and he's worth going in a notebook. He will win more chases. He's likely raced unexposed some of this form reads okay but the wheels have come off a bit and he didn't build on what i thought was a decent run at entry in this run and run atrociously for some reason like some of the tizard horses have been doing very in and out um but let me touch on captain tommy uh he's the one i want to focus on uh aged how old was he age seven this was the eighth chase run of his life. So again, the idea, is there more to come? Are they unexposed? Are they open to progress? Yes, yes, yes. Um, will they show that in today's conditions? Uh, will they prove themselves to be well handicapped in today's conditions? Why should they improve for today's conditions? Uh, do they have the class? Well, he did have some decent runs down here. Class one uh, novice listed hurdle, which actually worked out okay at the time. Yes, you're going back, but it's still, if a horse has shown a class, especially over hurdles, you can always live in hope that they're going to show it again one day over fences. This Cheltenham effort in heavy, to be fair, that was a class two handicap first run of the season. Another class two handicap hurdle here. So he had performed okay or fairly well at the class uh, there are two then there are two runs over fences in particular that i want to focus on there was this banger run at uh, in september and again the idea of hot form has the race produced winners uh, and what we had here man of the mountain then followed up before he ran in this utox to race man of the mountain followed up at cheltenham uh returned to decent ground uh, you know he had a soft ground had a bit of a mid-season break returned at Kempton decent run behind a well handicapped horse and then a drop in uh, and then the same trip but a stiffer track an aggressive ride uh decent ground leapt forward so he clearly bumped into 
uh, for the time of year, especially kind of a May horse, summer horse, decent form, decent horse, 130, who then won off 137. Versatility further back, he had won, and a few others even further down had run well. So that race had worked out well. Um, and then the other race, uh, which I want to focus on, was this Bangor run, Bangor run here in a class two, uh, where he'd gone fairly well. Um, and he was beaten by Not a Chance. Now, Not a Chance obviously came out on his next start and won the classic chase at Warwick. He had two amigos who's a solid, solid class two yardstick uh, behind him. So that front three, again, that was solid form, solid hot form. Um, we then had, as I jump around to the right race, uh, not that one either, um, a question of... Obviously, he had those decent runs, but he hadn't been winning. So why was he going to improve today? Um, well, he had a break after December and he had a wind up. So he had a break. He probably needed it. Uh, obviously, some horses first run after a wind up. If they have been struggling with their breathing or swallowing their tongue, it can take them a run to realise that there's no more pain and they can actually breathe. So that's why some horses can step forward on their second, third run after a wind up because that psychological uh, box has been ticked, I suppose, and they know that they can breathe and enjoy the final stages of a race, which are obviously can be the most punishing. Um, in any case, he returned after a break. He ran quite well, so that was a decent run. Um, and then he uh, returned to fences changed yards which was interesting uh, 23 days ago changed to david bridgewater so a yard change that could be a reason for an improvement in form even 23 days ago um or since his last run uh, david bridgewater was a decent decent trainer of chasers even just that couple of weeks change in routine could be enough to spark and they removed the blinkers which was interesting he'd worn them a lot um and removing headgear if it's been on a while can have the impact of uh, sparking a horse to life and improving them um now you there was a few questions for him there were a few unknowns uh, but I thought he was well handicapped against some of this form down here, especially some of these RPRs. He posted 130s in those two examples I've shown you. Plenty of his races have been working out well. Um, he was returning to decent ground, which might be another reason for an improved effort. Um, yeah, the headgear was off, chain of switch, second run after a wind up, there was more to come from him. And it was a race where everything had questions, including being in the hand, grip of the handicapper, stepping horses, stepping up in class, some horses just not looking in form at all. Um, so it didn't look that competitive. And then you were making a judgment against Price and he was nines. He should have been backed, uh, should have been tipped. For some reason, I just tipped the Tizard horse. I probably should have tipped both in hindsight, but it's always easy in hindsight. I was very, very close to him for the reasons stated. For some reason, I didn't quite get over the line, and I've been pondering why with him and a couple of other examples. The final one I'll touch on in a moment, um, but there's a couple of things I might tweak to, to get there, maybe relying on instinct more and not overthinking and bits and bobs, but you will always make wrong decisions. But if your shortlists keep landing on horses that are overpriced and horses that run well and horses that win uh, that can only be a positive moving forward so it is always best to stay positive in this game and to not dwell on missed winners for too long um, because part of the challenge uh, it is a frustrating game at times but that's part of the fun it's part of the challenge and if it was easy it wouldn't be so engrossing um, so that's that example which hopefully may uh I'm um, hopefully I've said something there of interest as well. And again, Captain Tommy, um, I thought would be, I thought he wouldn't be held up, and I didn't think all the ginger ones would be held up either, which he wasn't. Um, but yeah, so I thought he would probably be in a no excuses position there. But again, built into price, so that is Captain Tommy as I rattle around to 40 minutes. The other one I'm going to touch on on Burbank. I kind of had a short list of three. Which I suppose in what was a kind of 11 12 runner race, whatever. John BB, I fat well, it was John BB, um, Burbank, and Tommy Rapper. Uh, Tommy Rapper, I tipped at 12s, sent off at whatever price he was sent off, uh, three to one. I'll touch on him, Burbank, uh, and I tipped John BB. I still thought fours was okay, um, and I left off Burbank more fool me. Um, I'm gonna touch on him quickly, uh, just to see kind of the boxes he had ticked uh, but again I didn't quite get there which was my fox he was 22 to 1 30p rule 4 rather painful but this was just the eighth chase run of his life so again and the 24th of his career so again lightly raced assuming there could be more to come at one point did he have the class did he have the hot form well I could look all the way back to his early days 
He ran an eight length fourth in the um, Neptune grade one novices hurdle. So he's always clearly a horse who had a bit of ability. Uh, you know, generally you need some ability to do that in a festival race. Um, he'd run well in grade three handicap hurdles, as we can see here. Uh, and at the festival, um, that Clondor Castle forms okay. Good ground Kempton dominating beats Sayo, who was no kind of back number and absolutely tanked him there. Um, we then have more recently... Uh, this chase form at Newbury, I did home in on, but not enough. That was off one pound lower. He put in a stonking RPR, which I'd failed to kind of register properly, of a 150, my word. Um, so he put a 150 off a mark that was one pound lower than this entry race. Um, that race had worked out well. Tidal flow, well, okay. Tidal flow had come out and won. If you watch it back, though, he absolutely tore the race apart. The front two were miles clear. He was miles clear. He sm he hit the line so hard. Um, and as I reflected on this race, what I actually realised was this horse probably likes to dominate, and he's at his best when he's able to lead, which he did here, which he did here, and he did in his uh, National Hunt Flat race. He took it up fairly early. Um, he then was sold by Trevor Hemmings in his dispersal sale, um, moved to Jimmy Moffat, um, He'd obviously shown form in this, uh, so we've got some recent okay form. You know, he showed ability here, and those races weren't too bad, actually, uh, for all they were bum uh, uh, national hunt, uh, all-weather bumpers, jumpers, bumpers. Um, uh, he then ran in the Coral Cup, was this, at Cheltenham, and if you watch that back, he ran quite well. Uh, he was bang there, kind of three out, and bottom of the hill, uh, but then didn't quite have the pace, and those exertions took their toll, but he was only beating 14 lengths, 10 of 26. Um, I then, I think, tipped him at Aintree at a big price each way in the handicap hurdle, more for me, where he ran atrociously, um, and maybe this is an example of not putting too much weight on one bad performance um, and then I inextricably left him at Aintree why was he going to improve on this run here uh, well they changed the headgear blinkers came on and he hadn't worn them for a while and he had run well and bolted up in blinkers before so that was a reason why he may run well Brian Hughes was on ex-champion jockey Charlotte Jones is very good but Brian Hughes um is clearly an upgrade and actually Charlotte Jones Jimmy Moffat are worth keeping on over the summer she will make call on something of his if not more than one horse over the summer at a nice price probably around Cartmel and elsewhere um but as an aside uh yeah Brian Hughes she had a jockey upgrade a switch back to fences so for a horse who's clearly a bit of a thinker a switch back to fences might spark him up and there was the pace map and i knew all this i did all this analysis there was nothing which generally liked to lead and get on with it this race was there to be won from the front and with brian who's on with a horse with returning blinkers uh, so any kind of returning headgear or first time blinkers or visor or cheek pieces it can be good to assume that the horse may go forwards and may try and make all and if that's in a race with that much pace that is a big box to tick because if you can dictate and get in the rhythm which is what he did uh, and he took lengths out of the field at every fence uh, that is worth plenty you can save energy and he absolutely bolted up uh, recording possibly second best ever racing post rating certainly over fences of a 145 um, and it was a fairly open race Tommy Rapper I'm fine with that I could touch on him, him in a moment but again this this horse ticked lots of ticked lots of boxes he was well handicapped he had the class some of his races had worked out well he had a performance especially over fences i could uh, pin some hope around that demolition job at newbury if he got back to that level he was clearly always going to be competitive in a race like this especially with a few veterans in the race and a few looking in the grip of the handicapper um or up in class etc so that was no mission um but i was close not quite close enough but i will be close and i will find future burbanks um i've got no doubt about that uh, i could touch on tommy rap quick for you he looked wildly overpriced at 12 to 1 yes he was 10 but it was the fourth chase of his life fairly light raced um, again he had class and some good form at a good level down here uh, again here Aintree grade three um, he then returned to Exeter big run in a class two handicap this race had produced subsequent winners so hot form um, horses that had gone on and done well an RPR above the mark he ran off always a positive uh, you toxter watch the replay it looks a lot better than it does on paper he was bang there he traveled he cruised around he was bang there till three out decent run before his stamina gave way um, they then ran him over hurdles back at Aintree at the uh, Grand National Festival uh, and he was bang there until three out he was held up out the back he cruised around cruised 
goes into it throughout, walked through throughout. You can see one of his hind shoes fly off. Um, and he never went a yard after that and was just looked after. Uh, and then he returned to fences. Um, and yeah, there was enough to go on given how he traveled and his lightly raced profile and some of his back class uh, at what was 12 to 1 in a race where uh, and the other celebration was on a career high mark. Sir Ivan was on a career high mark. Carenta, I think, also on a career high mark, but had a class question also. Potter's Legend hanging around a career high mark. Horses stepping out of Vets Company, Veterans Chase Company into open company, arguably. Uh, versatility, back of an unseat, and he had a few class questions whether or not this level would be a bit too high. And Mance Raider, he was up a couple of classes, had been running well and in form, but in not very good races at all. Uh, so, sorry, Kelso's was certainly not a very good race, and he would need more. So again, there are reasons for why I could cross off some of these horses. I easily created a short list of three, and I ended up uh, backing two of them and omitting the what was in effect the 15 to 1 winner silly me um but yeah that's that that is uh four examples i think i've whizzed through hopefully said something of interest there and you can get an idea of my process so it is very much specializing it's opening up a race it's looking at each horse by horse by horse with all of these kind of questions and ideas in my head and I might have them on a list to my right and I might refer to them etc and make sure they're ticking those boxes or I'm asking how many boxes they've ticked and then looking at the race how competitive is it can I cross off horses uh, can I take a negative few to a fair few of the runners can I create a shortlist uh, before I will then obviously look at the pace maps and that helps um, you know make a positive or negative case the instant expert as well looking at some of the stats uh trainers inform jockey stats the trainer's record at the course whether the train whether the horse has any form at the course of course uh judging uh their suitability the conditions judging what they're doing differently and if from their last run and if i think that's a reason they're going to improve and so on and so forth racing post ratings i've touched on they're an important part of my armory and analytical approach now along with hot form that class question the pace maps etc hopefully you get the idea um, and then it's very much about having a process i will bring my uh, face back hope you can see me there hello um so yeah it's very much about having a process going through horse by horse uh whatever set of tools you use um getting an idea on pace which again whatever you, tools you use or race cards etc i think is vitally important especially for handicap chases pulling it all together, uh, getting an idea of odds, I suppose, in my head, then looking at the market and making a judgment um, and then hoping for the best <laughs> and then sitting back, uh, watching, analysing, uh, seeing how the race is run, how it works out and you can pick up and learn lots even if you don't find the winner in the race you're watching that will help you find future winners. So you're always learning, you're always picking up bits and pieces from watching these races and like I said uh, the more replays you can watch and videos you can watch the better. Um, but having some kind of specialism might not be a bad idea, having some sort of process uh, that you just go through with each race and each time that you try and fine tune uh, which suits your betting style and approach and the time you may have um, will hopefully make you even more profitable than you may be now um, but that's how I kind of approach handicap chases at the moment it's about fine-tuning my skills I suppose and making myself better uh, within all those things but they're the fundamentals and the questions that I like uh, to be answered and ticked uh, and like I said the final point weighing up what you know and what you don't know and whether that's built into the price and whether or not you can take a risk especially if a horse is doing something different if they're unproven at the distance or the class or the track or whatever um, and so on and so forth and generally focusing on horses where you think there's more to come and they're yet to hit their ceiling um, that is generally the place to focus in my mind uh, within horse racing generally on whatever you focus on whatever code um, so with that said thanks for watching uh, Obviously, do head to the blog or post a comment on YouTube or post a comment on this post on the blog. Any questions, uh, constructive criticism, uh, anything polite, always welcome in these parts too far away. Like I said, from Thursday, this become a member link 
page will go live um, where there will be an offer where you can join us for the summer uh, if you so please for uh, what will be a relatively kind of cheap rate for a summer season ticket and a monthly option also all with a 30 day uh, money back guarantee so if in 30 days time it's not for you uh, you'll be able to get a full refund no questions asked no bother um, if that's not for you no problem at all there will continue to be uh, plenty of free content and stuff you can get stuck into the free reports and systems tab here there'll be videos on youtube uh, etc and so on and so forth so hopefully something for everyone uh, that and if i do my job properly i will be helping you enjoy uh, or adding to your adding positively to your experience of horse racing and hopefully helping you find more winners and make more profit and i'll be trying to do that myself uh, within the tipping races uh, as discussed within the kind of two miles seven further um, and my star ratings uh, and all the stat stuff and trying to provide research, big race trends, flat festival stats, pointers, we've got Galway, there's all sorts coming up. Uh, there'll be plenty of content for you to get stuck into where I try and add positively to your experience of racing, all wrapped up with the great racing to profit community in the forum, in the comments, um, winning together is always much more fun and much more enjoyable. Uh, but until the next time, uh, this video has been going on uh, for long enough, I think, Thanks for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Uh, do click like, do click subscribe, the big red subscribe button bottom right if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, and yeah, until the next time, this is Josh saying thanks for watching. Uh, happy punting and bye for now.